All right, folks. Um, I'm going to get going anyway because the hour will fly by and I appreciate everyone's time here, first of all. First of all, to say welcome. Uh, thanks for everyone's time, as always. Um, hopefully, you're going to see lots of practical tips that you'll take into the classroom and be able to use tomorrow and get a lot of resource that you'll be able to use tomorrow. Um, obviously, today's webinar is going to be looking at improving lesson structure uh, using the natural world for leading cert geography. Um, we're going to be looking at improving lesson structure through the lens of our subcontinent, subcontinental region that's covered in the Natural World book, which is Brazil. A um, couple of housekeeping bits before we get going. So all PowerPoints that you see here today, all PowerPoints for Brazil, resources for Brazil, plans, schemes of work, units of learning, skill uh, tutorial videos, they'll all be shared with um, everyone that's attended here this evening via a Google Drive link that will be shared in the next 48 hours. Um, I'll also just say if you have any questions, we've uh, a reasonable enough group here. So if you have any questions, just throw them up into the chat function there for me. And I'll most likely stop and answer the questions as we progress throughout the session because we have a nice kind of um, small to medium sized group here with us. So any questions that pop up, throw them into the chat um, and we're just going to get moving, hopefully give you some practical tips and resources you can use in the Leave and Start classrooms um, tomorrow. Before we get going, I'll introduce myself. So I'm a geography, history and politics and society teacher in Woodbrook uh, College in Bray County, Wicklow. I provide some context to my school. Um, I work in a DESH school, so I work with a wide range of students and a wide range of students' needs in every single one of my classrooms. And um, that could range from at leave insert, you know, students who are sitting ordinary level, a junior cycle, students who are uh, sitting uh, L2LPs, and that leave insert down every single year, multiple students in every single class is looking for a H100 points in geography. And um, so challenging school in the given the fact that, you know, there's such a wide uh, range of students in every single lesson, but also one of the reasons that I love it. Um, I also have a leave insert revision podcast. It's called Skin in the Game. It's available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast covers leave and search geography topics in five minutes, links it to an exam style question. Um, and obviously it's a student-centered podcast. Um, I also work on UCD School of Education. So I'm a geography and history methodology lecturer there and UCD supervisor. Um, and I'm also the author of The Natural World. And um, hopefully everyone here has got a copy. Um, if you haven't got a copy of the book, I'd appreciate if you'd reach out to your local Edco rep, they'll send you out a copy. Um, book two and book three, so electives and options, they're all available and everything is good to go. The full package is ready to go. Um, I always laugh at myself when I say this, but I underestimated the amount of work that's gone into it, but I'm very proud of the, the amount of work that I've put into it. Um, so I'd appreciate you to grab yourself a copy and give it a look. So as I kind of mentioned there, full Leave and Search Geography package is now available for the natural world. Click for your local Edco rep, they'll send you out a copy. You'll see everything that we're going to cover in today's session and how that kind of links back to the book as we progress anyway. Okay, so if anyone's ever attended any webinars of mine in the past, um, I always just like to point people towards some further reading around kind of what's informed my practice and what is the kind of research or what is the foundation that kind of underpins everything that we're trying to do in today's session. Um, so further reading for today's session, the first thing I'll highlight is Why Don't Students Like School by Daniel T. Willingham. Uh, Daniel T. Williams, a cognitive scientist, and it's an excellent and practical book that looks at why don't students like school, looks at it from a cognitive scientist perspective, tries to give some kind of practical, pro practical approaches for us as teachers to improve the experience of school and improve teaching and learning in our lessons. Hugely impactful book. Um, I'm a big education nerd. Uh, I read a lot of books and sometimes with education books, they're not the best reads. That's a great read. Reads very well. Enjoyable. Can't recommend it enough. Second thing is going to underpin everything that we're going to do today is Boston Shine's principles and actions. So we're going to look at a learning sequence. And we're going to look at how we implement that at Leave and Search Geography. We'll look at it through the lens of our subcontinental region, but it's going to be applicable to every single topic that we teach. Um, and all of that's underpinned by Ross and Shine's principles and actions, this kind of I read you process. I'm going to refer to it as that'll make sense as we progress. Last thing I'll highlight, Teaching Secondary Science uh, by Adam Boxer. I'm not a science teacher. That book is about how to teach science, um, but I can't discuss how much it's impacted my own practice. I've taken a lot of what Adam does in the science classroom, adapted it and implemented it in the geography classroom. So a lot of what you'll see here today would be influenced by that. Just kind of show you where we are going today. Uh, five different kind of, or a roadmap for what we're going to do today, five different things we're going to do. First thing we're going to look at is what makes the natural world different. And um, then we're going to look at, it's not moving for me, 
going to look at this idea of a mental model of a learning sequence. So a mental model is basically a framework. So we're going to look at a framework for what learning looks like in every single lesson and how do we adapt that then in the leading search geography classroom. Um, we'll look at this idea of achieving mastery with our students. How do we get our students um, from the point that we pick them up? We're going to define them as novices. How do we get them to the point of mastery with the content and the skills uh, that are needed for the leading search geography course? And um, we're going to look at how does the natural world support the construction of I'm going to call them powerful learning sequences in our geography classrooms. And then finally, we're going to look at a walkthrough of teaching sub our subcontinental region uh, of Brazil and um, with the resources that are available as part of the natural world package. One last thing, just to kind of go through the structure of book two and book three, because I have received a couple of emails about this recently. Um, so in the natural world package, book two, uh, obviously the two books that are being brought out this year, book two and book three. Book two is our elective unit, which is our elective unit for economic activities. And it's uh, kind of joined together with our geoecology most popular option unit. Book three, human processes, it's uh, kind of joined together with our uh, most popular option unit, geoecology then is, uh, as well. And then available as ebooks are all the other options, so either global interdependence, cultural identity and atmospheres and ocean environments as part of that. So kind of first thing that we're going to look at today is why the natural world is different. And that's going to be important because it's going to feed into what we're going to cover today and what's underpinned the creation of the structure of the book and the structure of the resources that are available with the book as well. And um, so if to summarize why the natural world is different, I'd summarize into kind of four different points. Firstly, we'll look at the volume and variety of questioning that's available in the natural world and how that's going to impact our learning sequences and our lessons. Secondly, we'll look at this idea of the reduction in day-to-day -day planning for teachers, huge element of when I was planning the book, how do I make a teacher's life that bit easier? Thirdly, we'll look at success criteria for exam questions. And finally, we'll look at podcasts and video tutorials. I'm going to highlight these two sections for us here today, because this is what's going to underpin or what we're going to cover today is what has underpinned the creation of these two elements of the book. And how do we impactfully improve that when we're teaching subcontinental region Brazil and across all other topics at Leaving Search Geography? So first thing that makes the natural world different is just the volume and variety of questioning that's available in the book. So I'm going to put up four different types of question that's available in every single chapter in the book. Firstly, we have our retrieval practice at the start of every single topic, our differentiated tiered questions, our exam style questions with success criteria, and then we have a list of uh, most common past paper questions for higher and ordinary. Typically, each chapter in the world has on average 60 questions that we can ask our students. And that's going to be important when we move move forward with today. So just keep that at the forefront of our minds. Secondly, what the natural world does different is hopefully reduces day-to-day -day planning for our teachers. So most textbook, most textbooks just offer chapter summary PowerPoints that look like this. And we do offer that with the natural world as well. Uh, you might be familiar with what this might look like. To kind of break down what I think is wrong with these kind of summary PowerPoints is the first thing, um, it usually just includes large amounts of text and diagrams that are copied straight from the book. Um, and the three things that are kind of not wrong, but don't work for us as teachers are, it doesn't connect to the book or the content that teach, uh, students are actually engaging with and completing activities with. It does not include any teaching methodologies. And due to the large amounts of text and diagrams copied straight from the book, from my experience, if I was supervising or observing lessons, it usually encourages teachers to chalk and talk. Um, but most importantly, from a teaching perspective or a planning perspective, a teacher cannot use these PowerPoints without editing or planning. We can't just download this PowerPoint, walk into the lesson, and our lesson is ready to go. We have to think about the pedagogy around the content. So what's different about the natural world in that sense is that it offers these what I'll call uh, lesson plan PowerPoints. And they look like this. They might look at a different topic on the course as they structure the earth. And we've got different phases of learning and methodologies embedded in the PowerPoints. It reduces the planning that we have to do before the lesson. We go on to Edco's online platform, download the PowerPoint and teach the lesson the next day. We're going to look at this in a little detail when we look at the subcontinental region. But what those uh, lesson plan PowerPoints are constructed like um, they're constructed to mirror the structure of a lesson uh, that's going to reduce teacher planning and it's going to look to connect the digital platform or the PowerPoints to the book and the activities that are embedded in the book. And that's going to be really important. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it now because we're going to move on and go through that. The third thing that makes the natural world different is just the large amount of success criteria for exam questions that are built into the book. We have this write like a geographer section in every single talk, every single chapter in the book. And the Write Like a Geographer section gives students an exam style question, usually the most common exam style question from that chapter. So here, this is from Economic Activities and the Environment. 
and it breaks down that exam style question, usually a 30 marker question or with our geoecology, it'll be an 80 marker. Um, it breaks it down into a series of manageable steps to help our students maximize the marks that they receive. You can see it's scaffolded um, and differentiated to become progressively, progressively more difficult, breaking down into your answer must, should, and what your answer could include. Reduce the teacher workload again, differentiation is covered, scaffolding is covered for the most difficult tasks that we're going to ask our students to do, write our 30 markers or write our 80 markers in the exam situation. Last thing that makes it different, and we're going to get moving with today, folks, is the idea of podcasts and skills videos that are embedded um, in every single chapter of the book. I'm going to focus in on the skills videos here because it's hard to emphasize them. So there's a skills video uh, video embedded into the book for every single OS map skill on the Leave and Cert exam for higher and ordinary level and for every single sketch map for our regional areas. So I'm going to go on to the next slide here and you'll see a quick little snippet of what those video tutorials look like. There are video and a voiceover of me completing every single skill on the course. And you'll see that now here. Map of that country. Um, unlike our OS maps and our ordnance surveys, we're not dealing with exact dimensions or exact scales for our frame. Draw a nice neat key um, underneath. Once again, I'm using a ruler, not dealing with exact dimensions, just drawing it the same width as my frame for the sketch map. So it looks nice and neat. And you kind of get the point what that looks like there, but that's covered for every single OS skill, every single aerial photograph skill. And um, it's covered for all our regional sketch maps. So GDA, Western region, Paris Basin, Mediterranean, and our subcontinental region. And it's a really nice way what I do with my students every single year when it comes to this kind of final stretch with my six years. I'm sharing these videos on our team's page, gives them the opportunity to engage or brush up on their skills practice uh, as they get closer to the exam reduces the amount of work that we have to do in the lesson with them at that point. Brilliant stuff. Um, okay, so overall that kind of what makes the natural world different, just kind of going forward with what we're gonna to cover today. So the first thing I'm gonna to cover today is this idea of a mental model of what learning looks like in our lessons. So if I was to make that a little bit simpler, it's my framework for teaching and learning. So there are seven things that I'm trying to do in every single lesson with my students. And I'm gonna talk about this because it's gonna underpin everything that we try to do uh, later on when we're teaching our subcontinental region. So the seven things I'm trying to do in every single lesson, first thing I'm trying to do is give students an opportunity to engage in retrieval practice. And um, so that's usually through a do now activity or a five minute quiz at the start of every single lesson. I'm going to show you that when we see our subcontinental region in Brazil. Next thing I'm going to do is check in on prerequisite knowledge. So prerequisite knowledge is the knowledge students need to access today's learning. For example, if I was teaching global distribution of earthquakes, prerequisite knowledge to that would be the processes that occur at transform plate boundaries. So before I go to teach our global distribution of earthquakes, I'm gonna do a quick mini whiteboard check, prerequisite knowledge check or quiz. Do students understand the processes that occur at transform plate boundaries? Cause that's gonna impact their ability to access today's learning. Sometimes I talk about this, uh, sometimes the retrieval practice and the prerequisite knowledge, there's a very blurred line between the two, but in most of my lessons, I like to draw a clear line between both of them. First five minutes of the lesson, it's retrieval practice, five minute do now quiz, the students complete independently in silence. Then we've got our prerequisite knowledge quiz that I'll usually do on mini whiteboards. First, that means first 10 minutes of my 58 minute lessons are usually taken back on me checking in on students prior learning. After we go to retrieval practice, prerequisite knowledge, we're gonna go to our teacher explanation phase of the lesson. So this is the phase of the lesson where I'm gonna explain the topic, concept or skill that we're gonna cover in that lesson. You're gonna see me today explain primary economic activities in our subcontinental region of Brazil. So you'll see all that as we go. While our teacher explanation takes place and after our explanation, we need to check for understanding. Um, and I like to call this kind of being adaptive in our approach. So when we check for understanding, we need to use it as measurable data on whether students have uh, access to today's learning. Um, so the threshold I look for, or the threshold of success that I look for there is around 80% of students um, having success on my check for understanding. You'll see what we what I mean by check for understanding as we progress later today, but I'm going to go use use cold calling and mini whiteboards to check for understanding always. So if I don't have that 80% threshold of success, I go back to my explanation and I make it a little bit more simpler. I explain it in a more age appropriate fashion to the students, break it down step by step so that they grasp it, check for understanding again. Once I hit that 80% threshold of success, we move on to our next phase of learning, which I call guided practice. So this is the phase of learning that we're going to look to transfer the responsibility of learning to students. Now, we're not just going to move from I to you. We're going to do something together to bridge the gap between I'm 
telling them what it is or I'm teaching them what it is and they're working by themselves independently. So we'll go through multiple activities that we'll use for guided practice as we progress uh, in today's session. Just stick with me for one sec. After we do something with the students through our guided practice, we need to give them, I like the phrase, multiple opportunities with increasing difficulty at independent practice. We want to give students lots of practice to practice the topic, concept or skill that they've covered in today's lesson. Um, and that should increase in difficulty as they progress throughout those tasks. At the end of the learning sequence, then, or at the end of the topic, you're going to do a larger check for understanding, maybe through a more kind of extended writing task for um, a, a different task than just kind of getting students to ask questions, a larger kind of check for understanding, more summative maybe. And we use that summative check for understanding uh, as measurable data in our lessons as well. If we don't hit that 80% threshold of success, we go back teacher explanation and we work our way through the phases again. If we do hit that threshold of success, 80%, we move on to the next learning sequence and we go through our retrieval practice, prerequisites and knowledge, teacher explanation again. And that's where Ross and Shine's principles and actions you'll see embedded in what a learning sequence or a framework for teaching and learning looks like. We're gonna follow that IWU approach to transferring the responsibility of learning scaffolding the learning for our students. I'm going to teach them the topic, concept, or skill. We're going to do something together to bridge the gap between I've taught them and they've learned it. Once we bridge that gap, they're going to have multiple opportunities with increasing difficulty at independent practice to practice the topic, concept, or skill that we've covered at the end. Check, your, uh, check for understanding. Use it as measurable data before you move on. And this is important because this has informed everything that we're going to cover today, everything in my kind of methodology and kind of structuring the natural world, and then all the resources that are available with it uh, as a result of that. You're going to see all of this in action now when we look at primary economic activities in our subcontinental region. So just to kind of, I'm not going to have time here to kind of go through this explicitly, um, but I'd like to just share this kind of slide as well. And what this slide is going to do is break down each kind of phase of learning that we go through. And it's going to go through the methods to support or the methodologies that I've used to um, go through that phase of learning in our learning sequence. So if we look at retrieval practice, five minute introduction task when the students are asked to retrieve or recall information that they've previously learned. And um, it should take place in the form of an individual quiz. And um, what you'll see is our kind of retrieval practice embedded into two different elements of the natural world in our chapters and then at a more kind of micro level in our PowerPoints. And you'll see that as we progress. Our prerequisite knowledge then, as I explained in lots of detail there, so students need the, the knowledge students need to access today's learning. I use mini whiteboard quizzes or cold calling to check for understanding there. Teacher explanation then, my kind of six steps if I'm looking to explain something, teach it bit by bit, funnel attention, reduce redundant information, limit distraction, repeat messages and use supports. I like to go um tree or wood trees wood and um, kind of big picture small picture big picture um, and then we're going to give them worked examples to understand it as well after we explain we're going to go through our check for understanding cold calling mini whiteboards again you'll see that in action as we progress guided practice lots of different ways that we can transfer the responsibility of learning we'll look at a phase reading today success criteria models of excellence all of that will be embedded in our resources today then they have their independent practice multiple opportunities with increasing difficulty to practice the topic, concept, or skill. End of the topic, then we're going to go through that kind of larger check for understanding. It's more summative, maybe it'll be extend, an extended writing task uh, or a task that links to an exam style situation. And that's going to inform everything that we're trying to do in every single learning sequence uh, that we talk about. I'm going to go back one second because I reckon I missed a step there. I use the word learning sequence because in the past, I would have defined my planning in terms of lessons. So I had... Honestly, I had a 40 minute lesson planned. I knew what I was teaching in every single 40 minutes or in every single 40 minute lesson that I had across the two years at Leave Insert. And then two years ago, my school threw my plans in the bin and we changed the hour long lessons. And at the time, I was kind of like, where do I even start? But that actual opportunity to sit down again and think about my planning from that perspective really just changed the way I viewed my planning. I used to view teaching and learning on a lesson to lesson basis that I need to teach this inside that 40 minute block. And by me having that mentality, it really kind of um, limited my adaptiveness as a teacher. I was like, okay, these are the 40 minutes I'm teaching this. I and I kind of had the mentality that I've taught it, it's on you to learn it. Um, but by switching to that hour long lesson to kind of rip my plans apart, it allowed me to be a little bit more adaptive in my planning. Now I don't view kind of topics by teaching them by time. I view topics in kind of learning sequences. Some learning sequence is going to take me 40 minutes of an hour long lesson. 
done is going to take me six hour long lessons um, and not all topics are equal and I shouldn't be defined by the bell in every single lesson uh, in my planning. So that's where this idea of learning sequence came from, from me moving away from just kind of that planning to lesson to lesson, as you will. Okay, brilliant stuff. But where does all this come from? So I'm going to just introduce you to a quote from Daniel T. Willingham from that book there, Why Don't Students Like School? I introduced you to at the start of today's session. And this quote's just stuck with me. So as I said, Daniel Willingham, he is a cognitive scientist and he looks at how do students learn and he talks about uh, extended practice. So he says it's impossible to become proficient at any mental task without extended practice. And that stuck with me. I was like, how do we give students extended practice to become proficient at the task we ask them to do in geography? And for us to understand that, we need to understand the two different kind of maybe stages of learning we might get our students at. So the two different stages of learning that we're going to get our students at are novice learners. And then hopefully by the end that we're after we're done with them, they're going to be expert learners. Um, but if I'm going to define a novice learner first, a novice learner is um, a stage of learning as students begin studying new topics, their knowledge of that topic is going to be low, is going to be low. And with our expert learners, that kind of stage of learning, uh, when we might define a student as an expert learner, um, we might say as they learn more, the things they learn become more interconnected and they and they can begin to think about problems differently. And that kind of links into that idea of critical thinking. Um, and I kind of love that, you know, we need to teach our students how to be critical thinkers. But for students to be critical thinkers, they need lots of knowledge because that knowledge becomes interconnected. It allows them to view kind of tasks or problems differently. And that's what we're going to look at today. So I like to view that kind of stages of learning on a spectrum. So you can see on our spectrum here, we've one end of the spectrum, we've got our kind of novice learners. And at the other end, we've kind of got our expert learners. So we're going to look at two profiles of students here. And then we're going to ask the question, how do we move from learner A to learner B? So if we look at the kind of profile of learner A, he's down towards that kind of novice end of our spectrum. And learner A learns more effectively, I suppose, um, as per cognitive science um, or as per how humans actually learn, learner A learns more effectively when presented with worked examples and they need teacher guidance to understand new knowledge. Learner B on the other hand, up towards that kind of higher end of our spectrum or that expert end of our spectrum, learner B learns better through, um, or learner B is slowed down by worked examples and learner B will seek out knowledge on their own hypothesis. So they will, um, problem-based learning or problem solving is uh, something that's going to push learner B and they'll learn better giving the opportunity to problem solve and be inquisitive in their learning. And that kind of leads us to the question, how do we move a student from novice to expert? And cognitive science has kind of given us four key findings about getting a student from a novice to an expert. I say student, it's about getting a human from a novice to an expert. The four things we can do to move a human from a novice to an expert. Firstly, we can one common factor with experts was that they had a large exposure uh, to high amounts of practice along their learning journey. So students need lots of practice to become experts and have lots of knowledge. Number two, novices need large amounts of guidance and worked examples to understand the concept. So if we pick a student up at the start of fifth year and they have never dealt with plate boundaries before, it's a very, it's almost an impossible task for us to give students an opportunity to go, okay, give them a problem about uh, constructive plate boundaries and they have to solve that problem. That wouldn't be the most efficient way for us to teach them about constructive plate boundaries. We should give them large amounts of guidance, worked examples and scaffolded support to teach them about constructive plate boundaries. At the end of that learning sequence, then give them the problem solving activity about maybe comparing and contrasting constructive and destructive plate boundaries. Third thing um, cognitive science has shown us about getting a student from a novice to an expert is that practice is most effective when blocked together early on. So after we introduce students to a new topic, they need lots of practice early. As time moves forward from that kind of after you've taught them that topic, we can reduce the amount of practice that is necessary. And that kind of leads us into point four. As student proficiency increases, the practice becomes more effective if it's spaced out into regular size chunks. Chunks, And that's where our retrieval practice comes into play. So what we're going to look at today is how do we give our students large amounts of practice? How do we give our students large amounts of guidance and work examples to help them understand the concept? How do we block that practice early? 
so that students become experts at that topic, concept or skill that we're covering. We won't have an opportunity to go on to retrieval practice, but you'll see how it's embedded in every single uh, PowerPoint slide and every single topic in the natural world. Okay. First thing that we need to look at is that the chapters in the natural chapters in the book of the natural world and the PowerPoints are constructed to ensure that large amount of practice is blocked early together for students after they learn a new concept. So if we look at the kind of a mixture between the activities and the questions that are available in the book and the PowerPoints together, we've got a retrieval practice in every single chapter in the book. We've got a retrieval practice for every single topic in our PowerPoints. We've got our differentiated tiered questions in the book that are moved from our scaffolded and differentiated to move from basic to advanced. We have our exam style questions with success criteria. In our PowerPoints, we have a progress check or exit tickets at the end of every single topic checks in on students learning using the key concepts they need to understand from that topic. And then at the end, we've got our past paper questions, higher and ordinary for that kind of larger sum of assessment check at the end of our learning sequence. Um, and just to kind of show you there what that actually, or to, to give you an insight into what that actually looks like for students, between the book and the lesson plan PowerPoints, each chapter has on average 60 to 70 scaffolded questions for students to engage in guided and independent practice. If we were to look at one of the larger chapters like rivers, river processes, for example, we could have plus 80 scaffolded questions or different types of questions for students to engage in. So that practice is blocked together early for students so they gain mastery of the, the, uh, the topic that they're studying in that lesson. Okay. So just to kind of walk you through the structure of the book and to show you how it mirrors that idea of moving or how it mirrors the idea of what a learning sequence looks like and how it mirrors that idea of moving students from novice to experts. So each chapter in the natural world is structurally is structured to mirror our learning less our learning sequence structure. We have a retrieval practice and our prerequisite prerequisite knowledge at the start of every single topic. We've got our learning intentions um, and our goals built into every single chapter. We've got an explanation of every single top or every single topic inside topic and subtopics inside each chapter. We've got opportunities for student guided practice through our scaffolded success criteria activities. We've got students for opportunities for student independent practice that give them multiple opportunities with increasing difficulty. Every single topic has nine questions in the book. And then we've got a summative progress check at the end of that kind of uh, chapter of the book that mirrors that larger check for understanding for our students. Um, at the end of every single chapter, then as well, you've got your exam your sample answer with think like an examiner feedback gives students for an opportunity to see what model a model of what excellence looks like. Moving on to the kind of structure of the PowerPoint. So this is what we're going to see in action now in literally two minutes. So the le lesson plan PowerPoints are constructed to reduce teacher planning and they're structured to ensure that they support student mastery of the content. They're also designed to mirror the structure of a lesson and connect the digital platform for the bus book. There should be almost zero planning for a teacher if they wanted to just use one of these PowerPoints in one of the lessons. So in every single uh, lesson plan PowerPoint, we have a knowledge retrieval activity. It's a retrieval practice, prerequisite knowledge. It connects what we're learning today to what we've learned previously. Introduces students to the learning intentions for that topic. It goes through or breaks down uh, every single topic for that chapter with a teacher explanation so it usually has a piece of stimulus, maybe a diagram, maybe an image, and it's got an annotation around that diagram or image to support the teacher explaining the key aspects of that topic or concept. It's got opportunities for student guided practice that connect to the book. We're going to look at a phase reading approach in today's kind of lessons that we look at to look at how we transfer the responsibility of learning to our students. We've got our opportunities for student independent practice built in through our, maybe it's our write like a geographer, maybe it's Maybe it's our check for understanding differentiated questions. And then we have our summative progress check at the end of every single topic, excuse me, that are differentiated questions that you won't see in the book built into the PowerPoints to get, make sure that students have large amounts of opportunities for practice as they progress. Okay, we're exactly where we need to be. What we're going to be looking at today is our subcontinental region of Brazil. So obviously I've given you a large amount of information there. Hopefully the two biggest key pieces of information that we've looked at there is our idea of what a learning sequence might look like and that idea of moving a student from a novice to an expert. So what we're going to look at is we're going to zone in on one lesson from our subcontinental region of Brazil. We're going to look at primary economic activities and we're going to look at how do we work our way through those phases of our learning sequence and how do we get from that maybe retrieval practice at the start to our progress check at the end. Just to give you an insight, uh, 
obviously with every single topic in the book, we have our schemes of work that are planned, ready to go, every single topic for the whole curriculum that's from core book one to all of our options, all embedded into the schemes of work there to suit obviously each individual department in their individual schools. We also have units of learning constructed for every single topic of the book. Uh, units of learning are more kind of micro approach to planning. You would maybe more familiar with it with it with it at junior cycle and um, where we're kind of expected to have units of learning constructed for every single learning outcome of taking that approach and use it for leaving search just to uh, preempt what is coming from the inspector in terms of planning expectations for us as teachers and then we obviously have our we have our lesson plan powerpoints that we're going to look at today so obviously i'd love to walk you through every single topic in brazil um, but I just haven't got the time and I wouldn't want to waste your time as much. I wouldn't want to waste your time either. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on one lesson or one topic from our subcontinental region of Brazil. And mid walkthrough of this lesson, um, I'm going to stop and explain the different methodologies that I use at different points in the lesson to support my implementation of that learning sequence. So specifically, we're going to look at maybe how we improve our checks for understanding and formative assessment and our guided practice elements of every single lesson. So as I said, we're looking at primary economic activities in Brazil. Um, we'll just kind of take ourselves through a walkthrough of what that might look like. So the start of our learning sequence, we're going to go to our retrieval practice. That's built into our knowledge retrieval activities here. So our knowledge retrieval activities are usually, or I'd usually construct them as a five minute introduction quiz to students complete independently in silence um, at the start of every single lesson. So with my retrieval practice, I like to build routine into my students. So this is going to be in the same place every single day. It's built into my PowerPoints. Um, it's nothing crazy. It's just five questions from a topic that they've learned previously. It's usually going to inform or be some prerequisite knowledge check of what they need to understand today. So if I was to set this up with my students, it'd be built into the routine with them, but I'll set it up every single day the same way. OK, can I get copy books open? I'm going to put five minutes on the clock working silently, independently. I want you to answer these five questions into the back of your copy book. You need to write full answers. I want to see one word answers, full answers, five minutes, silent, independent work. I'm not, I have a little timer at the front of my classroom. Time starts in three, two, one. I press my little kitchen timer on. It's kind of glued to my whiteboard. They can see the time and they have that five minutes up, five minutes at the start of every single lesson to work silently, independently and to check in on the retrieval practice. The idea of retrieval practice is that it is just an opportunity to recall information that they've learned previously. They don't have to get all the questions right. As students are completing this retrieval practice, I will circulate intensely. I'm not sitting at my desk, staring at the computer or whatever. I'm circulating and I'm providing support and extension activities for the students that need it. So I'm supporting the students that might need support in accessing the learning. So, for example, if I was to come down to this question here, number four, oh, excuse me. Question four here, describe the climate found in the southeast of Brazil with reference to temperature and precipitation. I might circulate to a student um, with a, additional educational needs in the lesson and I'll provide him with maybe a piece of success criteria to answer that question. So I might write, his, write on his copy book. Um, your answer should include subtropical climate, 25 degrees Celsius, blah, blah, blah. And I'll give them that piece of success criteria. Also circulate to the higher achieving students in the lesson. And I'll give them an extension activity. So I might just go down and I'll say to the student, if they were describing the climate found in the southeast of Brazil, they might finish this in three minutes. I might go down and I might write an additional question, describe the climate found in the northeast of Brazil with reference to temperature and precipitation. So looking for them to discuss that semi-arid climate in the northeast of Brazil and pushing them to achieve a little bit more at that point as well. So five minutes started the lesson, they go to the retrieval practice, then we move on. Then I'm going to direct attention. So can I get pens, pencil? Big part of my lesson is kind of directing attention. And um, I want to have an economy of language. So I don't, if I'm saying something, I don't want to repeat it twice. And I want to make sure that everyone's listening. In order to do that, I'll walk through um, these kind of steps to direct attention in every single lesson. So my phrase, and I get sick of saying it every single day. My students laugh at me after about three months. And I go, okay, can I get pens, pencils down? Okay, brilliant stuff. Can I get eyes and ears with me up the front? Okay, brilliant stuff. I'm still waiting on five sets of eyes. Okay, still waiting on two sets of eyes. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Rebecca, for the attention. Thanks, Carl. Okay, brilliant stuff. I've got everyone's eyes. Appreciate it. And then I'll give them a little spiel. Okay, the only way, I only ask this, I'm not a weirdo. 
The only reason I asked you to look is because as a teacher, I'll never actually know if you're listening. It's impossible for me to tell. But at least if you're looking at me, you're giving me the impression that you're listening. And that's what all I care about. So at least give me the impression that you're listening. And I'll go through that. Okay. Pay our learning sentence today. What we're going to cover today is primary economic activities in Brazil. And our learning intention for that lesson is to discuss the physical and socioeconomic factors that have affected the development of primary economic activities in Brazil. When I introduce students to the learning intentions, then I'm going to check for understanding. Do they actually understand the learning intention? So I'll cold call students. Cold call students is a practice I'll use. I'm going to explain it in two minutes, um, where I'll follow a no hands up approach to answering questions in my lesson. So that's the rule. You can't put your hand up to answer, answer a question. You can only put your hand up to ask a question. Okay, physical factor. What is a physical factor, Carl? Okay, socioeconomic factor. What's that making reference to, Rebecca? Okay, excellent. So if we're dealing with primary economic activities, what are we dealing with? Give me an example of two sets of primary economic activities, Carl. Check for understanding what the learning intention before we move on. Then we're going to go through that kind of phase of learning where I'm going to explain the topic, concept, or skill that we're going to be covering in today's lesson. So the first thing that I'm going to explain in today's lesson is the types of agriculture in Brazilian regions. So when I'm going through my explanations with my students, I'm going to deliver it step by step. I'm going to check for understanding after every single step. I'm also going to include some checks for listening to ensure the students are listening as we progress. So when I introduce this, I'm going to direct attention again. Okay, guys, I'm going to put a map up on the board. It's going to be overwhelming to look at the start. You might be thinking, what is going on on that? I want you to just take 10 seconds to yourself. I want you to look at the map. I want you to look at the key of the map, the different colors. And I want you to just maybe look at the colors that dominate the map most and understand what their corresponding definition is in the key. Okay, 10 seconds by yourself, look at the map. And I'll give them their 10 seconds to look at. Let them go through it. Okay, eyes and ears back with me, please. Okay, waiting on five sets of eyes, waiting on two, waiting on one. Okay, brilliant stuff. Okay, what I want you to now look at is the yellow area in the map. Okay, that yellow area in the map is related to cattle rearing. Okay, and commercial cattle rearing in Brazil is a significant part of the agricultural economy in Brazil. So... To give you an example of that, commercial farms in Brazil can have up to 120,000 cattle each on that farm. Okay, excellent stuff. Can I get mini whiteboards out there for a second? I'm going to go through a check for listening before I progress with the explanation. So I want to hold students accountable to make sure that they're actually listening. Okay, I've got two questions for you. I'm going to give them to you both. Can everyone take out their mini whiteboards? Answer the questions on your mini whiteboards, please. Okay, first question is what type of, or no, how many... On average, how many cattle can a cattle farm have in Brazil? Okay, mini whiteboards out. Okay, hold your mini whiteboards upside down when you show me. Okay, three, two, one, show me. Everyone shows at the same time. We got through that. You're going to see that now in one second. Okay, can I get mini whiteboards wipe away from you? Okay, eyes and ears back up with me. Okay, excellent stuff. Second type of agriculture we're going to look at in Brazilian regions is coffee plantations. And what we need to understand about Brazil is that it's the world's largest producer of coffee. Um, coffee contributes on average every single year about five billion to the economy and it also accounts for about eight million people working in coffee related industries in brazil so significant element of the economy and large contributor to the economy and if i really want to if i'm not sure students are listening with me i might go okay mini whiteboards out again i'm going to check for on check for listening to make sure that they were listening around the facts around coffee plantations in brazil okay when we go to our explanation, funnel it bit by bit, direct attention, break it down, check for understanding. And that leads us on to this kind of next section that we're going to cover, improving that form of assessment in your lessons. So as I kind of gave you a brief example there, 90% of my form of assessment in every single lesson is carried out through cold calling and is carried out through mini whiteboards. Um, I'd say the other 10% is carried out through standardizing the format in my students' copy books, but we're not going to have time to go through that today. And what I kind of say to my PME students, when I pick them up at PME one, is I'll say, you should be asking students what feels like a stupid amount of questions. It should feel like you're asking them too many questions. That's when you know your form of assessment is actually informing your practice. And I'll explain it's not good enough to just ask the questions. You need to use that as measurable data to inform the direction in which you're going to travel next in that lesson. So you're not just asking them the questions, you're gaining data and understanding on whether they understand the content that you're teaching them. And you use that to inform your practice. So if I've just explained from primary economic activities in Brazil, and they haven't under, understood the impact of coffee plantations to the agricultural economy in Brazil, mm -hmm. 8 million jobs, 5 billion annually to the economy, I need to go back and I need to reteach that content. Anyway, let's keep going. 
first thing we're going to cover is cold calling. So as I kind of briefly described, cold calling is the practice of calling on students where, regardless of whether they've raised their hands. And it might look something like this. Okay, I'm, or I'm just going to introduce you to this kind of phrase of questioning. And um, we're going to look at maybe how we can make one small, small tweak to improve the kind of structure and impact of our questioning for our students. So in my explanation there, now I didn't ask it like this, but I might have asked it like this. It's a very common thing you might see in a lesson. Okay, I'm going to cold call a few questions, folks. Um, Laura, what is the main climate of the southeast of Brazil? And you might look at that question and go, yes, yeah, seems like a reasonable question to ask in the student or to ask your class. But we've done one thing wrong here that's going to impact you and the students who are participating and engaging in our lessons. To understand that, we need to understand who's doing the thinking, who's doing the participating in our lessons. So when I phrase a question like this, OK, OK, I'm going to cold call a few questions. OK, whole class is thinking, whole class is listening, whole class might be sweating. OK, he's going to ask me another question. And when I say Laura's name before I deliver the question, we lose the rest of the class. Now just Laura is doing the thinking in our lessons. So when we structure our lessons or our questions in our lessons, we need to move the student's name to the end of the question. And it might look like this, and it feels counterintuitive uh, to actually do this at the start. Okay, I'm gonna cold call a few questions. What is the main climate of the Southeast of Brazil? Laura. Now when we think about who's doing the thinking in our lesson, whole class is doing the thinking, then when I call Laura's name, I can lose everyone else's attention and we are good to go in that sense. Small tweak with our questioning. It feels counterintuitive at the start. It's going to improve the ratio of students who are thinking and participating in every single phase of your learning. And we're trying to improve that at every single activity that we complete. What that might look like for us or when we think about cold calling as a form of assessment tool in our lessons, I might be up the front of my lesson. I've just explained primary economic activities in Brazil. Now I'm going to cold call a few questions to make sure students have understand. So I might cold call Laura a question. OK, what was the maybe two types of agricultural activities that take place in Brazil? Cattle rearing and coffee plantations. OK, excellent stuff. OK, um, on average, how many cattle are on a commercial cattle farm in the Brazilian agricultural economy. Rebecca, okay, 120,000, excellent stuff. Okay, how many people are employed in coffee plantations in Brazil? Dane, okay, excellent stuff. And if you think about that from an efficiency point in our classroom, we probably used about two minutes of class time to ask three questions and gain data on three students' understanding, which in the grand scheme of things is really good. And if I, and as I said, if you're if you're doing that kind of practice in your lesson, you're absolutely doing everything uh, or as much as you're doing a lot right of what we can do. But then once again, I suppose what that leads me to is the problem with cold calling. So if we look at that cold call again, OK, I'm going to cold call a few questions. What is the main climate of the southeast of Brazil, Laura? OK, we think about who's doing the thinking. OK, just Laura. OK, excellent stuff. Now, when we think about who's doing the participating in this element of the lesson, we just get to Laura. We have the 26 other members of the, or 26 other students in the lesson who don't have an opportunity to participate. They had the opportunity to think, but they didn't have the opportunity to participate. So in my opinion, the most effective way to check for understanding and consolidate student understanding is through mini whiteboards. And honestly, I'd say 80% of writing that students do in my lessons from first to sixth year is on their mini whiteboards. And I'll show you what that looks like now. Okay. I'm going to ask a few questions on mini whiteboards oh, and the kind of routine I go to. Okay, mini whiteboards, I'm going to ask a question. Okay, how many people are employed in coffee related industries? Now we think about who's doing the thinking in that activity, who's doing the participating. We have the whole class thinking and participating in every single uh, question that we, every single form of assessment question that we ask in our lessons. For me, the most important aspect of using those mini whiteboards in our lesson is to make them part of this explicit routine. And this is one of the first things when I pick up a class in first year or fifth year, I spend maybe the first, at least the first hour and a half, less than a half with the students going through the routines of what I expect them in every single lesson. So I go through, this is how I expect you to engage in your retrieval practice. This is how I expect you to engage when I ask you uh, the cold call a question, I'll go through the routine of no hands up to answer a question. This is the routine around using your mini whiteboards. This is the routine around turn and talk. This is the routine around group work. This is the routine around peer assessment. And I go through all those different elements of how I expect students to engage in the lessons and I make them explicit. Obviously, you don't have time to go through all that today. What you'll see here is the routine around the mini whiteboards. So the routine I'll go through every single day is like a mini whiteboards. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. 
then I'll ask the questions. I want you to hold your mini whiteboard upside down your desk when you're finished writing uh, to tell me that you've finished, what that might look like. I don't have a mini whiteboard here. I have my laptop case. So students might write their answer. I get them to hold it on the desk like this. Um, then when I see that everyone's finished writing their answer, okay, three, two, one, show me at the same time. Everyone lifts up their mini whiteboards. Then, okay, mini whiteboards down and their instinct is to wipe it straight away. Don't wipe it. Everyone looking at their whiteboards. Then I'll call on the correct student to, I'll call on a student who had the correct answer to call out that correct answer. Okay, Carl, what was the correct answer? Everyone self assessed. Okay, now mini whiteboards wipe. Next question. Hold them upside down. Three, two, one, show me. Mini whiteboards down, don't wipe them. And I have to say that every single time because I know myself, good instincts just go wipe that mini whiteboard. Just to show you from an efficiency perspective, when we think about that three minutes of class time that we use to cold call students our questions, um, now we can use that two minutes of class time to ask three questions and gain data on 81 pieces of student understanding, improving the efficacy of our formative assessment, our check for understanding, using that data to inform our practice, also improving the ratio of students who are participating and thinking at every single uh, phase of learning in our lessons, small switches that have a big impact on teaching and learning. Then we get down to our kind of next topic in that kind of element of Brazil, and you'll see how this might work through. Um, we might walk through this really quickly because I'm just looking at the time here. Okay, so I'll introduce students to how the relief of soils, the relief in soils in Brazil enable intensive coffee plantations to develop along the kind of southeast or the southeast coastline and into the kind of mid midlands in the Brazilian highlands of Brazil. Okay, I'm going to put up an image of a coffee plantation in Brazilian highlands. Can you take five seconds just to take in what that image looks like? Okay, brilliant stuff. Okay, can I get eyes and ears with me now, please? Waiting on three sets of eyes, waiting on two, waiting on one. Okay, brilliant stuff. Excellent. So we know coffee plantations or coffee agricultural activities play an important role in the development of Brazil's agricultural economy. What we need to understand is how the physical factors of Brazil have impacted the development of the coffee agricultural industry. The two biggest factors that have influenced that are the mountainous terrain and the subtropical climate found in the southeast of the country. These two physical factors enable the intensive production of speciality copper beans and therefore or thus has allowed Brazil to become the largest producer of coffee in the world, contributing 5 billion euros annually to the economy. Okay, brilliant stuff. I'm going to keep going because I can still see that I have students' attention. Second factor that's impacted uh, intensive coffee plantations in Brazil is the high altitudes of the Brazilian highlands. So the high altitudes there um, make the crops less susceptible to pests and diseases, thus maximizing the productivity and the commerciality of the crops for the farmers, making the farming more efficient for the farmers, and allowing them to make more money. Okay, brilliant stuff. I explained the topic. I checked for understanding mini whiteboards, Cold calling. I might ask a question. Okay, many whiteboards out. Okay, how do the high altitude of Brazilian highlands impact coffee crop production in Brazil? Okay, three, two, one. Show me. I get whole class data on understanding. Okay, we've worked through our teacher explanation. Now we're going to go into that phase of learning where we look to transfer the responsibility of learning. So we're going to look to do that in this instance through a phase reading. Um, and the PowerPoints, lesson plan PowerPoints for the natural world, link students to what they should read at different parts of that topic. Now, I'll say disclaimer here. I will never set students off to read individually. And my rule of thumb with that is because there is no way I actually know if they're reading. My rule of thumb is the only way that I know for a fact that a student is reading is if they're reading out loud. So that's why I'm going to introduce a phase reading approach at this point. Just to kind of show you, a phase reading approach is just a, a, a teaching methodology that we can hold students accountable to reading out loud. So how we lead a phase reading approach might look like this. So we're going to start with a teacher-led model of what good reading sounds like. So I'll use you as a phrase. Okay, guys, I'm going to start us off. Can I get fingers on the page following along? And my fifth year laugh at me every single year I pick them up when I say, okay, fingers on the page following along. I'm like, sir, I don't have to put my finger on the page. I can follow along from read. Okay, okay, brilliant. I'll give you one chance not to follow along because I need my finger on a page. The first time you can't follow along, you have to write out the text for me. Have we got a deal? Brilliant stuff. I'll go through our phase reading. One student won't call it out. Everyone will have a good laugh. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. Next time, you have to write it out. I've only ever had one student write out the text that we're reading once. I do this from first to sixth year. I give them the opportunity. I give them the second opportunity. If they still don't do it, I expect a finger on the page. Okay, so fingers on page follow along. I need you to be prepared to pick up at any point. 
this is how I read the text. This is what I expect you to sound like when you read out loud. Loud voice, pause a comma, stop a full stop, all that good stuff. Okay, second thing, we're going to keep durations unpredictable. So we're not going to state the duration in which students are going to read. It's going to cause students to not follow along or follow along, follow along a little left. Third thing we're going to do is keep duration short. It's best to allow students to read two to four sentences at a time than drowning through these kind of large periods of writing. Keeps everyone engaged. Fourth, we're going to keep the identity of the next reader unpredictable. We're going to cold call students to read randomly. We're not going to allow students to nominate themselves to read purely to that because... You know, it's usually the best readers in the lesson that are going to put themselves forward to read. Thus, we're not actually having a kind of equitable classroom. We want to give students who might not have the strongest reading abilities in the class an opportunity to read, improve. So the expectation is that every single student follow along and I can pick the next reader at random at the end of any sentence. The thing we're going to do is try to reduce transaction costs. So a transaction cost is the time it takes to execute an exchange in readers. I will literally just say, Shane, pick up. Um, I won't waste time in that or I won't increase the transaction cost by going, okay, excellent reading, Shane. Can you pick up Rebecca? Because I just want to keep the flow of reading good. Um, but if a student who you know maybe struggles with reading does read well, I'll go around to their desk and I might give them a thumbs up or I'll tap on their desk and be like, yeah, well done, brilliant stuff. But I won't, I'll keep those transaction costs short just to improve the flow and to ensure that comprehension is high as we're reading the text. I'll use teacher-led bridging to maintain continuity. So if a passage of text, um, the reading breaks down, maybe a student struggles with a word, stutters, maybe something happens less than everyone laughs, happens all the time, uh, I'll go back, I'll model what good reading sounds like, I'll set the tone again as you move forward. Seven, we'll have a spot check. So um, Sorry, yeah, I'll have a spot check. So the spot check and the kind of placeholder I'll use with my students is, okay, hold your place and follow me. And that kind of spot check and placeholder that I use allows me to stop and answer questions as we read. It allows me to stop and check in on comprehension as we read. It allows me to give students an opportunity for retrieval practice as we read. And it allows me to basically gain measurable data on students' understanding. So I'll use, okay, hold your place and follow me. If we've read something that as we read it, it wasn't very clear in the text, I'll explain it to the students. I'll break it down step by step. If we cross a piece of text that gives a good opportunity to check in on something we've learned previously, okay, hold your place and follow me. Okay, we just read about primary economic activities in Brazil and how the subtropical climate there, high uh, I suppose moderate precipitation and moderate temperatures um, enables the production or intensive uh, commercial farming to take place in the region. And I'm okay, when we studied the Paris Basin, what climate enabled the intensive production of commercial farming? And I might cold call a student to answer that question. Um, now, I'll usually plan those questions beforehand. They won't be just off the top of my head like that. And as any teaching methodology, it should be imbine, embedded and combined with other activities or uh, lessons in our other phases in our learning sequence. So it should feed on from our explanation and feed into our student independent practice. Um, what you might see, it might something like this. So we might lead that phase reading just to kind of show you. As I said, it's hard for me to show these activities here. We're not in the classroom. Um, but it might look something like this in my lesson. Okay, guys, might be at the start of the lesson. We're going to read through the reading here on page four of eight of the natural world, some primary economic activities at Brazil. When I get fingers on the page following along, listen to how I read, pause a comma, stop a full stop. I project my voice. Can everyone please be prepared to pick up at any point, stop and answer questions at any point? I'll start reading. Okay, Shane. Pick up for me, please. As I'm reading, I'm circulating. Okay, Carly, pick up. Low transaction costs and me changing students. Okay, hold your place and follow me there. Okay, when the text discuss their subtropical or the subtropical climate in Brazil and how that enables the uh, commercial farming to take place in the region, what does the text mean by commercial farming? Shane. So a check for comprehension, check for student understanding as we read. Okay, excellent stuff. Okay, Rebecca, pick up. As Rebecca reads, I circulate. Okay, hold your place and follow me there. Okay, we just got introduced to the idea of um, whatever cattle rearing in Brazil. Um, we learned that on average, a cattle farm or cattle, a commercial cattle farm in Brazil can have up to one hundred and twenty thousand cattle per farm. And I'm gonna go. That's a, a a concrete example of what commercial farming looks like: farming to make a profit rather than farming, um, subsistence farming or semi-subsistence farming to farm to make a living, as you will. And okay, Rebecca, pick up, please. And we keep going through our phase reading, constantly stop, checking from understanding, constantly stop, 
uh, explaining uh, concepts to the students and we move on to the next phase of our lesson. So in this kind of agricultural or uh, primary economic activities in Brazil here, you would have seen that I've moved from the subtropical climate to how the physical factors that influence farmers, or I've gone through the physical factors that influence farming in the region. Now I'm going to go on to how that subtropical climate allows intensive soybean farming to take place. I go through my explanation. After I explain, we complete some guided practice. I go back to my explanation. Now I'm going through socioeconomic factors, access to markets, government initiatives. I explain them to students, talk about how that access to the large internal markets for selling agricultural produce, show them this map of Brazil, uh, cities in Brazil that have a population of over 500,000, show them the sheer amount of them. I explain the road infrastructure, how that impacts access to market for farmers, the large domestic market that's available to the farmers. We read, go through that guided practice together. Now students are going to complete independent practice where they're going to answer this exam style question, how climate and access to markets influence the development of Brazil. If you recognize that's a sorry excuse me that's a 30 marker taken directly from an exam paper it breaks it down step by step in a must oh excuse me in a must should could success criteria there to allow students to answer the questions and um, they complete that in the lesson at the end of the lesson then usually on mini whiteboards i go through a progress check or an exit ticket i'll ask students the questions to ensure that i check for understanding at the at the end of every single lesson then the lesson plan PowerPoints in the natural world move on to the next topic. And as I said, they're completed for every single topic, every single chapter across the whole book. I like to think all the planning is done for you guys. That is everything from me with three minutes to spare. What I just like to say is, listen, thanks so much for your time, guys. I really appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, I can't see anything in the chat here. If anyone does have any questions, fire them in. I'm going to hang around and answer those questions. Um, but hopefully you've just seen here, uh, I suppose, that idea of a learning sequence, the idea of moving students from novices to experts, blocking practice early for them, and then how we look to structure our lessons to support the learning sequence and to support students getting large, large amounts of opportunities at practice to ensure that they move from novice to experts in dealing with the content that we study. Anyway, that's everything for me, folks. As I said, I really appreciate the time. I'll hang around and answer any questions there. Other than that, resources will be sent out in the next 48 hours. And yeah, listen, I just hope everyone has a great end to the year. And yeah, I really appreciate it. My email address is on the screen there anyway. Any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch.